Like I'd always sort of like sung and stuff in school. I went to public school and I did chorus class. So I did that and I did like um, musical theater in school. Like I played Annie in a school play and I was really into it. And um, I was always interested in that, like in singing. And then, um, but I never really thought I could be in a band because it was really mysterious to me and I thought it was like super hard. And it had always been sort of like cloaked in this, you know what I mean? This thing that was like totally impossible that I could ever actually do it. And then um, I lived in Olympia, Washington because I was going to college there. And um, there's a label there called K Records. and. They um, are really supportive of people being punk rock in a way that isn't normally punk rock, like um, people not knowing how to play instruments and just trying, you know, and they had a lot of people on their label that I would see like walking around and I knew that they had records out and I'd be like, wait, I drink coffee in the same place as that person or I walk by them on the street and if they're doing it, why can't I kind of thing? And I started thinking about it and then I um, joined a band with some friends of mine called Amy Carter. I started going to shows when I was 15. I went to hardcore shows in Boston, the area I grew up in. And it really never dawned on me that I could be, at that point, I could be anything more than just a participant at the show. It was just some, you know, all my guy, all my guy friends were playing guitar they, from a really early age, but at that point it was really not common, especially in New Hampshire where I grew up, for um, women to play instruments. It was just, I didn't even think I didn't even think to play at that point. And um, I came to DC in uh, 1984. And I went to school at Georgetown University. And I was a sophomore. And I heard a guy down the, the hall from me was selling his bass. And I'd always, always been really attracted to bass guitar. I just like how kind of low and powerful it is. And I went down. It was 300 bucks. It was a Fender Precision. It was a beautiful bass. and. Uh, I just took all my money from working that was supposed to be for school and I just bought the bass. It was kind of an impulse. I started playing guitar when I was 16 and a friend of mine played guitar and we were sitting in his room and he had this little Fender Mustang like Eddie Van Halen style. It was red with the white tape and everything. And He was real excited because he had figured out Crazy Train from Ozzy Osbourne. So we were in his room jamming and he was jamming and I was watching but I picked up his guitar and I was just messing around. He said, hey, wow, you know, you can do bar chords. How'd you do that? And I was like, well, I don't know. And from that day forward, I figured I was born to be a guitar player. And we went out. And for my birthday, my mother bought me a Strat copy, Sunburst guitar. And it was history after that. Cool. I was addicted. <laughs> Well, growing up, I really hung around with a lot of guys, mostly than, more than girls, so they were all real supportive of my playing guitar, and they taught me a lot, and we would just, you know, rock out, and I didn't really think there was anything weird about it. I knew I was probably the only girl in my high school that played electric guitar, but I just kind of went with it, and I knew that, you know, like Lita Ford was out there with the Runaways and Joan Jett and stuff, and I just decided that was what I wanted to do and it didn't hold me back that, that there just weren't many women in the world. Yeah, I did this scam back when I was in um, high school when um, that first Joan Jett came out. She was coming through the punk club and I had a friend who was in the art department draw me up this logo for this supposed fanzine that I wrote for called Night Hogs and I called up the club and said, hi, I write for Night Hogs and I'd like to know if I can have an interview with Joan Jett, I'll be bringing a, you know, a photographer as well. And they said, yeah, come to Soundcheck. So I went down to Soundcheck and uh, she was, and I got to see some Soundcheck and she was, um, you know, she came in and talked to us, but she said she didn't want to do the interview until after the show. Her manager told her that. And she wanted to know if I wanted to play pool, but I was totally nervous. I was too, I mean, I did not take advantage of the situation at all. I was too much of a wreck. So my photographer friend played pool with her, and I, I asked her some questions. I asked her if she had a lot. I thought, I thought she was, like, loaded. I asked, I mean, I know now, I see, of course, I mean, I was, I was, guess I was 17. I, I just thought, like, that she had a house with a swimming pool, and that she was, like, totally loaded, and, you know, and all of this stuff. And she was like, no, I never had a hit, except for cherry bomb in Japan so no I don't have any money I live on ten dollars a day per diem and life is really very hard 
and I was just like stunned. But fortunately, it was just a little while later. It's just a couple years later when I Love Rock and Roll happened, and she's been, you know, she's been living probably the good life since then. <laughs> Kid, I used to go from house to house in my neighborhood and I would knock on doors and I would ask people if they wanted me to give them a little show and you know and they'd say oh sure come in <laughs> you know give us a show so I would come in with my guitar and I was a total little tomboy I had total Roy Rogers he was my idol my only two idols have been Roy Rogers and Madonna those have been the spectrum out of which I've operated in my world. And, um, and I would be in my little cowboy outfit. I always dressed very specifically for my shows. And I would go out and, and um, give these little performances. I'd like, sometimes people would have me stand up on the coffee table or whatever. In fact, I met the very first depressed person I've ever known through my little shows because there was a woman in our block <laughs> Mrs. Katz, whose husband had died, and I guess Mr. Katz must have left Mrs. Katz a significant pension of some sort because she didn't have to do anything except sit in a darkened house and just be depressed all the time. And I was the only person in the block who really ever saw her because she loved my little shows. And she would <laughs> open the door, she'd open it just a crack, and she'd go, oh, it's you, Kay, come in. And I would come in. <laughs> And I would stand on top of her little coffee table and sing my little songs, and she would give me candy. And I guess, you know, that's part of what this is all about. You sing a little song, and someone gives you candy, and you can't give it up. There was one day when I wanted to be in the school band, and the, the teacher, Mr. Frankel, said, well, bring your sticks and a pad to school and, uh, and show me what you can do. So I brought my sticks and pad to school in my little book bag and uh, went in there and, and, and you know, I, I don't think I knew how to do anything at that point. I mean, that's why you're supposed to be in school band, is to learn how to play. I wasn't taking lessons. And he said, well, we have enough boys playing the snare drum, but you can play the clarinet or the flute. And <laughs> so I took my pad, I put it back in my little book bag, and um, went home, and then my mom uh, got, I got lessons, but not, I didn't really learn anything from that teacher either but I just pretty much learned playing the records. You know, like Joan Armitrade, when she was a child, her father hid her guitar from her because he didn't believe she should be playing guitar. So to the extent that she was even able to find the hidden guitar and continue to play it and not get discouraged and grow up to be, you know, someone who made a living expressing herself through her music, to me is a very political thing. And it's very exciting. So anytime a woman picks up a guitar, anytime a woman picks up drumsticks or picks up a microphone and dares to go on stage and say what's on her mind or sing what's on her mind or express herself in any way, I think it's a, it's, it's a radical act. You know, we're taking our space culturally, and that's important. First time I ever got up on the stage, I sang a song a cappella by myself about me and my girlfriend Heidi, like walking around with razor blades wrapped in matchsticks because there was like, you know, we were like worried about getting attacked, like in Olympia, which is a small town and a lot of shit happens there. And um, and I sang it like in front of all of these people, and I was totally terrified. But it was totally a rush, and I did feel like I totally changed the dynamic of the whole room, and it was a total power trip. You know what I mean? Like, to have people, like, pay attention to me. And I really felt like most of my life, like, my parents didn't pay attention to me. Nobody paid it. You know what I mean? Like, I felt like I couldn't say the things I wanted to say. And, like, through this I can. Sometimes I just want to sing because I feel like it connects me to something. For me, being in Sankola is probably the most empowering thing I could do. Um, it, I feel the most powerful as a woman, as a person on stage. I'm not afraid. 
I'm often more afraid with one person or like in a crowd, you know, of three people than I am on, on stage. It's the most comfortable home for me. Because a lot of people are watching me and I'm telling them my most personal things and they're listening and they may not know even what I'm saying or what we're all saying and what I'm singing because I'm like singing, you know, maybe Carrie's experiences or Greg's experiences or my experiences or Chris's experiences, but, uh, but they're listening and it's affecting people and um, whether they hate it or love it, you know, that's going to be empowering. Um, just to see people mesmerized, just to see people moved. I mean, you know, I think we're a pretty captivating band, and it's fun to captivate an audience. That's in, that's empowering. You know, like one time, for example, at an Antone show, everybody was sitting when we walked out, and uh, they were all sitting Indian style, these kids. I couldn't understand, like, what are we? And I said, what are we, a fucking folk rock band? And I said, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Everybody stand up, stand up. And they all started standing up, and they all looked at each other, but they all stood up. And then I was like, dance, dance. And so they started, you know, they, I mean, sometimes they think we're like some ethereal kind of groove band, but, but you can dance to us. I started WAD because um, I wanted to get a group of women together that didn't know how to play instruments really well at all. None of us like knew what we were doing, you know, at all. And um, I didn't. My boyfriend at the time played bass, and I, uh, you know, I just kind of bought one for twenty-five dollars, and you know, just started playing. <laughs> Like, one song is called PVI is a lie, it's penile vaginal intercourse is a lie, and it's, uh, Andriana was taking a women's studies course at UMBC and uh, got this essay given to her by the teacher uh, that was from the radical lesbians. Uh, they had written this, le uh, this essay <clears throat> on what Freud did to women and stuff like mentally and what other countries do to women uh, about sex, you know, and, um, it just, you know, we all read it, she made copies, and we all read it, and we were just like, God damn, you know? <laughs> I mean, Women of Destruction, like, Andriana put it the best way uh, when someone asked what, what our name meant to us, and Andriana said that it's the destruction of old stale male ideologies about women and I and I like that a lot. I, I started playing at ABC or Rio and uh, with a lot of like boy bands. Just boy bands. It was just it, and I wasn't really respected. I just got on the drums with this new band. They said, you know, like come and play drums. I lied, I said I was playing for a long time. And uh, I just started playing with them and it was totally influential. All the guys said I sucked. And I'm just like, I'm gonna prove him fucking wrong. Well, first of all, I'm absolutely thankful for being a woman. And I'm thankful for being a musician. Um, and I feel that sometimes, especially in that like punk rock scene when I was starting out, like guys were really critical. You know what I mean? And I felt that that pushed me. So I'm kind of glad. I'm thankful for that because I feel if maybe that they weren't, then I wouldn't have really pushed myself to make a difference. Like I totally see this whole thing happening. It's like that my poster will be on a wall, right? And all these girls will be looking up to this poster, like Melissa, Melissa, and all the parents are gonna be freaking fucking out because I'm a dyke, you know? Because they were like, oh my god. The barrier I had, to, I wanted to overcome was the gender barrier. I didn't want somebody to look at me and go, oh, it's a girl playing guitar. I wanted somebody to look at me and go, she's really good guitar player. This is a really good guitar player, not this is a good female guitar player. I didn't want gender to come into it at all. <laughs> Thank you.
when it was just my own private thing and nobody knew, it was okay. When I saw those bands on TV, when I saw the Beatles on TV or the Doors or something, I imagined myself playing that guitar. I didn't imagine myself married to that guy or hanging around with him. I imagined myself playing that guitar. So in my mind, it wasn't a barrier at all. When I got into high school, and realized that, you know, you start forming high school bands and you play Stairway to Heaven at the prom or whatever, and I was not able to participate. Tina Weymouth had just, you know, the talking heads were just getting popular, and so it was kind of okay if you were female to play the bass. Be real quiet and pretty and play the bass. So I was, I, I was able to play bass sometimes with people, but mostly I was ignored musically. When people see me, and even when they've seen my band, and they see me, like, just on the street or something, they'll come up to me and go, you play bass, right? And I'll be like, no, I play guitar. They just automatically assume that I play bass. And I don't know why, it's just a girl thing. And I don't, I have no idea why more girls play bass. Either they assume that I play bass, or they assume that I sing. They never, they, they would never assume that I played drums. The thing I usually get when I come down off a of stage is men saying, how did, you, how come you play the guitar like that? How did you get to play the guitar like that? As if I'm, you know, a fairy dust fell on my head instead of that I worked every day. So what I get is sort of a minimization of my effort sometimes, but I can't say that anything, I feel like anything has really gotten in my way. There's been rudeness. <laughs> and stuff, but I, I can't really say anything's gotten in my way. I think there's a disadvantage because there's a way that women are not encouraged just to be that loud in the world and take up that much space. and roll, you know, always is going to bridge a certain gap. It's always going to take you into male territory, whether you want to be there or not. Women's music, as it was defined in that, in that period, always kept you with women, which was good. I mean, I, I have no problem with that. But the minute you get into rock and roll, you're going to get into the face of the rest of the culture, because this culture in the United States has been eating rock and roll since, you know, 1955. And it's just voraciously interested in what rock and roll can provide. So the more that lesbians do to provide energy through rock and roll and a point of view as well about lesbian culture, you know, it's a great medium to work in. It's fabulous. You can't beat it. Well, we had, like, in the 70s, you know, Patti Smith and all these folks doing really cool stuff and the runaways and all this but um but then in the 80s it got really weird and kind of you know there was a lot of women doing music but it was sort of pop and there wasn't a lot of like room for women to be you know it was still sort of there were boundaries around what how we could express ourselves and what was acceptable and certainly what was marketable and I think the same is true in rap music and reggae that you know certain type of women were acceptable but don't push the boat. Don't don't rock the boat too much. Don't push things too much. But lately, in the last few years, I feel like there's been a lot of uh, there's been a resurgence of feminism in music, which I think is really exciting. That women are not afraid to call themselves feminists. I mean, I just read even in the mainstream press. You know, I just read a sort of a little profile on Joan Jett in Entertainment Weekly of all places. Not you know, not like they're the cutting edge. And it was really cool because she talked a lot about women's issues, and I think she even used the F word, feminism, you know, which I thought was kind of a cool thing. I would never have started Girls in the Nose um, simply to do sort of songs about the world, songs about myself, songs about, you know, I don't know, ice cream and 
I interviewed a lot of women on the road. Any woman in a band I met, I would interview them with a tape recorder just to prove they existed because there were so few at the time touring. And so, and I wanted to talk to them, but I didn't think it was cool just to talk to them. So I'd interview them on a tape recorder just as my way to like have an in. And I wasn't even doing a sound scene, but I just pretended I was. And um, I'd interview them and I'd ask them like, um, what rape had to do with their music? What did, you know what I mean? Like, what did like economic issues have to do with their music? What did like, you know, their, like, what did, you know, like race, class and gender kind of stuff? have to do with their music. A lot of women were like, said it didn't have anything to do with their music and it really depressed me. And then I had this fountain called Jigsaw by Toby and um, she said it did affect her and she talked a lot about like gender in terms of her being interested in punk rock. And um, I was like, oh my God, I have to be friends with this girl. I have to be friends with this girl. So I wrote her a letter on the map on our, when we were touring. Um, and I was like, I want to be in a band with you when I come back to Olympia. You know, I want to be friends with you. I want to be in a band with you. Like I just totally took this leap of faith. And um, I ran into our Sonic Youth show in Portland, Oregon a couple months later. And um, I said, do you want to do that? And she was like, yeah, we planned our first practice. And then the so deal happened. It's like, uh, I think that a lot of the girl bands, you know, out there are uh, writing about women's issues and stuff and sticking it in people's faces. So that makes them different, too. You know, it's not like people are just up there writing love songs, you know, all the time or songs about their car or something, you know. It's like, you know, I, I think that, that, I think over time it'll change. And I hope that it's not a fad. You know, I hope people don't see it as a fad, but that's the way I see it in the media. Culture has such a profound influence on people. Um, and if you can change culture and the kind of images that culture presents um, and the kind of ideas and messages that culture sends, um, then you can really affect change in, in, um, on a very deep level. Um, and I think that's just as valid as going to a march or signing a petition or, you know, um, you know, other forms of ac activism that we generally think of, you know, that when we think of activism. I think music has been the center of a lot of political movements. I come from a tradition of people who use music as a way of communication, as a way of storytelling, as a way of documentation, as a way of passing on through the generations messages and important lessons that people need to know. And so with that amount of power, you know that those songs are used when people are in struggle. And so that's where I come from, and that's how I use it if I need to as a political weapon. I think that, like, in America especially, there's this really weird division between politics and pleasure. And I'm really interested in blurring that line and fucking with that because I think that if, um, if our definition of an activist or of somebody who is political is this rigid idea of being the opposite of fun or being really like dowdy and square, nobody's gonna, the kids aren't gonna wanna do it. Do you know what I mean? And the kids aren't gonna think it's fun. And it's like, and I'm not just saying like, oh, I'm, I'm on this like martyr fucking mission to like make it fun because I'm not, I do this for myself. You know what I mean? The thing that I'm interested in doing is really addressing women through my music and through the lyrics and creating a firmer and more solid and more visible community of lesbians by saying, you know, we should do our breast exams, we should practice sodomy, we should, you know, you should bite me, you should, you know, all of these topics that, you know, I've written about in the past number of years, they really are, you know, they're about eroticism and sex and power and all of these kinds of things, but they really are you know, they, they're very much directed at women, and at lesbians in particular. I mean, any other woman can pick up on it, and any man can pick up on it if he wants to. I don't care. But the songs were written for lesbians. Okay, girl rock is indeed revolutionary. The nice thing about, you know, music with lyrics is you've got this double combo. You've got the words and you've got the music, this kind of way in which it's almost like two-pronged to seep inside you and grab hold and make you just be walking around, <laughs> you know, whistling something and then you go, oh my God, what the f 
fuck am I singing under my thumb for? Why does it have to be such a great hook? It's such a great hook. Under my thumb. You know, so I think that it's, I mean, it's just the means that I have chosen, you know, to try to, to try to affect people and to get, and to get, you know, under their skin and to get inside their brains where this thing is rolling around. I mean, I think that hooks are really important. I guess partly I think that what people, when people have a problem with political songs because it's just not hooky enough. It sort of depends on how you define politics. Like, is it a big P or a little P? I mean, I hate to be so cliche, but you know that old phrase, the personal is political. It's kind of like, okay, Katie Lang has done this really radical thing by coming out of the closet, and God damn, I love her for it. You know, it's great. It's helped all of us who, who are lesbians, I think, in a big way. But her music is not political. Her music's not political at all. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's how she was able to come out and still remain successful and still remain sort of like in my family's, my parents' living room on their TV set, you know? I mean, I'm glad that this big old dyke is on my parents' TV set and that they know who she is and they love her. That's a great thing. Um, but I do think there's also room for progressive content in music. There are a lot of lesbians who listen to Bikini Kill and they're, they're interpreting it as lesbian music, you know? There are a lot of straight people who are listening to the Indigo Girls and they know that the Indigo Girls are gay. And so they're like listening to gay women sing, you know, or lesbians singing about something and they know or okay d lang you know that's a that's you know perhaps an even more important figure who's come out you know so that when straight people listen to her on the radio constant craving you know they know that she's constantly craving for a gal you know they're, you know it's it's very important that you know that women like it's as important for you know for women like um, for Katie and Melissa and people like that to be out as it is, you know, as it is that we carried the standard that we never, we didn't give a shit, you know, because we weren't famous enough anyway. It didn't matter. Nobody was paying me to be gay or not to be gay, you know. You know, there's this argument that gay artists use about, like, not wanting to use the same gender pronouns in their songs because it'll exclude straight people. And, you know, last I noticed, straight people, gay people, were, are, we're always able to find ourselves in straight songs. I mean, we're, we, you know, we've mastered that art. You know, you hear a song, a man singing a song about a woman, and it's clear that he's using a female pronoun. Well, we can always imagine ourselves, because we've had no choice, we always imagine ourselves as being the subject or the object of the song. So, you know, it's only fair to think that maybe heterosexual people are also capable of making that leap, you know? But, the, but I know the argument from the artist is going to, the artist is going to say, well, we don't want to exclude anyone from our music. A really major component of homophobia is that the onus is on us to stay closeted. People will say, I don't mind what you do in the privacy of your bedroom, just don't flaunt it in my face. A person gets queer bashed and immediately their friends ask, well, were you holding hands? Well, were you kissing? The onus is on us to remain in the closet. People go, do what you want, but don't talk about it. Don't ask, don't tell. All of that stuff is that it's, it's a very different oppression because we are told everything would be okay as long as we pass. Not everything, everything, because it's getting pushed even further, like don't even do it. But, but that is a big chunk of homophobia that is a tremendous pressure on us. You do not have to come out to your family as black. They already know that, you know? But you have to tell people that you're queer. You have to do that. You don't usually have to tell them that you're female. You don't usually have to tell, you know, and you have a family that already knows and may be the same as you. But you can be queer and not have any other queer family members, you know? And so that's a really, really nasty and pervasive aspect of homophobia, is this whole appeal to everybody thing. Who the hell appeals to everybody a president is the only person who's supposed to try to appeal to everybody and that's a job I'd never want you know I mean do you you don't tell straight people well, why don't you have like more queer songs and we go crazy when somebody like Garth Brooks does which I think is fine which I think is good you know but it's 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 wrong it's totally wrong and it's completely uninteresting to me now, in terms of the, the whole concept of artists being political I really think 
Like, I'm an activist, and I would love for every artist in the world to be an activist, you know, and for all the queer artists to come out and be gay activists and all the, you know, women to be openly feminist and be on, you know, upfront and outspoken. But the fact of the matter is that I think it's, I think it's really unfair to expect all artists to be good spokespeople. You know, it's not in their genetic makeup necessarily to be, um, to be, you know, sort of politically astute or to be able to articulate a political position. I mean, I think artists need to first and foremost follow their, their, their instinct and their heart and their soul about how they need to express themselves and what it is they need to say because I think ultimately if they say, if they express themselves in a manner that's true to who they are, then their values will come through to us. It may not be blatant. We don't need to be hit over the head by boring political music that really just doesn't have any artistic sense. You make a political statement just by being a strong woman in music because it is still male dominated. And for me, that's a political act. And um, I don't need to, and we don't sing about it in a three minute song because I don't really, I, for me, I don't find like three minutes of lyrics to be an effective vehicle for political change. I'd rather, I mean, if there are moments that I've, I'm deal, um, direct, dealing with sexism or something, I, I like to just confront the person right then and there, talk to them, and I find that to be a lot more effective. I, I think I've just gotten more introspective over the last two CDs and spent so much time in that world and where everything was political. The, the problems that we ran into being a, a really outspokenly political band was that everybody's got an agenda. And it's, it gets hard. It, you know, it's like a, it's a balancing act. And this group would be mad because we wore glitter-covered dresses on stage. And then this group would be mad because I ate at McDonald's in the interview or whatever. There would be you know, so many forces pulling at you from all sides. I think women just said, you know, we're tired of this shit. And so now women are starting to say, fuck you. You know, we're pissed. We're going to take what we need to take. You know, we're going to talk about issues like incest and rape and sexual harassment and loving other women and all these issues that were formerly taboo. And and we're going to make records, and we're, we might even make some money, which is not a bad thing. Women and artists really strongly need to have a sense of entitlement. Like, I have a right to, to play this guitar, to play in a club, to get paid as much as that boy band who played before me. And, you know, uh, it's, it's that, that's got to happen. And I think that as our numbers increase, hopefully that, that will indeed happen. The issue is being a woman who is, it's a few aspects to it, because one, I'm the lead singer, so I'm the focus of attention. I'm the girl, I'm the cute girl in the pretty dress who sings, look at me. And, you know, so in one respect, I'm presenting myself that way, and yet I do all the organization behind the band. I book all the shows. <laughs> I do all the postering and the Xeroxing. I make my own silk screens. I make my own t-shirts. Um, I make my own records. I do my own distribution. Um, I have I have my P.O. box that I go to every day and take the mail out, and it's a lot of sludge work. And um, so it's a lot of business behind the scenes. And time that I see my being a woman and being like the, not being the business person who who makes who makes agreements for the band I do see sometimes like people don't don't want to take the female as seriously especially when on stage she's I mean there are certainly other dyke bands like Tribe 8 who get on stage and they're all hard and they just want to be like as loud as any other male punk rock band and that's personally not me um, you know for me, I'm, I am, I am feminine, and I, I like to wear dresses and whatever stereotypes a lot of people will put on that. Okay, maybe I, you know, 
whatever. If I'm, if people think I'm cute or people, if I have a high voice, maybe they're not going to take you seriously when you're off stage and you're, you know, now you're talking about, okay, let's make a deal. You look at sort of some of the quote unquote Riot Girl labels, which are not really Riot Girl labels because there's really no such thing as ownership of Riot Girl, but. Um, some of the band, some of the labels that are signing a lot of Riot Girl bands, they're not women owned. You know, Simple Machines is one of the few independent record labels that's women owned. And I think we need and Queenie now, you know, based here in New York. And I think women need to start building their own companies, so that we know that when the when those the trendy winds shift, and we're no longer in favor people don't think feminism is cute anymore, that we're not going to be screwed again and relying on other people to tell us, well, we'll let you through the gate today, but we might not let you through the gate tomorrow. You know, we need to own the fucking world. Never underestimate just the systematic racism and oppression in any business system, not just the record industry, but in any business system. You, you'll see how quickly things are labeled and clumped and put in these certain things. That's in order to sell it as a product. That's the way you sell products. You label it, you identify it, and you make it marketable to a mass audience. And white men have always had a, had a problem trying to figure out how to label and produce black women because we don't want to be labeled and produced in that way and so usually when you put those two groups together you know it's going to be a lot of problems the space that has been made for black women in the music industry is too small it's too thin it's too limiting it's too little period you know we need a big humongous huge space and they don't want to give it to us so that's why we have to make our own space and do our own things and not be waiting for some white guy to come in a suit and say, wow, you know, you're really hip. Uh, I think I can make you the next Tracy Chapman. Boom. You know, get over it. Get out there, do your own thing. I think that what's, you know, of course, very radical is what a women want to sing about. Because a lot of times it's, it's different from what men want to sing about. And women need to be heard. Everything. Every, every, I'm, I'm just, you know, when I was younger, I tried to buy every single thing put out by women, and I can't, I can't keep up anymore. I just cannot keep up. And it's, it's kind of a drag, and it's mainly fantastic, you know? I mean, that is, like, so great that there is so much. No one ever told me I could be a, music, a singer. I play guitar now. No one ever told me that, you know? There's been people who have supported me, but mainly you have to support yourself because there's a lot of people who will want to bring you down. There's a lot of people who, who, who will be jealous or who won't support you. Um, you just really have to support yourself and have the initiative to do it. Um, because you never know. I never knew I could sing. I never knew, I never knew that I could be a, a front person until I tried it. And I, I tried it, and I was good at it. And, and then I realized that I need singing lessons, too. So I went out and took singing lessons um, so I would quit losing my voice. But it didn't stop me. I just, I just did it. And, and now it's like, wow, I never knew when I was 21 that I would be a front person of a band. Having a band is really as easy as just doing it. Because really, w one thing that's so cool about punk rock is it's shown us that anyone can have a band. You know, that's, that's to me is one of the most valuable messages that has co that have, that's come out of the punk rock movement. Um, they may not be great bands, but they're bands, and I think that's really, that's really great. So to me, you just have to start somewhere. You just have to start by taking that effort, and it is, you have to make an effort to just start a band.
In Fargo, North Dakota, we showed girls how to plug instruments in and not get electrocuted because that's one of the big fears that a lot of girls I might have is getting electrocuted by the instruments and so like we do stuff like that and now this tour is so different than our tour like two years ago we're playing with a lot more women bands there's like girls that are like 13 and 14 that have started bands you know like bands like, like girls who came to our shows who we were like why aren't you in a band and now they're in them and that's like fucking that's the shit and it's like even if like you know what I mean even if I'm not totally perfectly happy with like every recording we've ever done or something like that to me that you know what I mean? That is successful. That means I'm successful.